I tell you what, it's, it's not, not like, like the olden days. days. I'm Rosie. I'm Jake. And this is our podcast on The Vicar of Dibley, which is another BBC sitcom. It starred Dawn French. In fact, I might say it stars Dawn French as Geraldine Granger, the Vicar of Dibley. Using the present tense there because at the time of recording, it's still going on in the form of short lockdown special broadcast pretending to be on Zoom things. But we're not going to talk about those. We're going to talk about the main series, which started in 1994, when it had its only traditional six episode series as BBC sitcoms tend to do and after that it came back sporadically for mini series and specials and things like that. Now rather like Inspector Fowler played by Rowan Atkinson in The Thin Blue Line there has been at least one blurb on cable TV guide or something describing Geraldine Granger as bumbling a bumbling vicar and that isn't actually correct at all. It's a sitcom unusually about somebody who's actually very good at their job, unlike Gordon Fritters, who we talked about last time, and Basil Fawlty and people like that. And really, it has to be because it's a sitcom with something to say. The ideology behind it is really that quote in a season two episode of The Adventures of Sinbad, traditions change as we grow more enlightened. It is, or was, when it started out, all about the opposition to woman vicars. And even though actually that's really quite quickly resolved after the first six episodes, it is nodded back to and mentioned occasionally, right up to the last couple of specials. And it has been said between us that really it used up all its ideas of that premise, someone is against the woman vicar, and then after opposing her for a while, actually comes around to her and realises that she's good for the village were used up in the first six episodes. There was that six episode series which again like the British Empire I think our parents watched without us and then one day turned round and said oh it's the Vicar of Dibley tonight we're going to watch the Vicar of Dibley I think you'd like the Vicar of Dibley Jake and Rosie. I was expecting, from my knowledge of Dawn French and French and Saunders and that kind of thing, a bumbling vicar, like in this blurb, but unlike the person who wrote that blurb, I watched it and soon realised that wasn't it at all. So Jake and I were introduced to the Vicar of Dibley with the Easter special, which, as I said, doesn't really carry on that theme of, oh no, women vicars. She is just being the vicar in a comedic situation, and it was very amusing, and we did enjoy that. And then the following Christmas was another special, the Christmas Lunch Incident, which they seem to always nowadays show on Christmas Day. And that's very, very funny, and I think the peak of the series. Both those specials aired in 1996, nothing in 1995, and then the next we heard of it was Christmas special again, 1997, but it's not actually that much of a Christmas special. And then I remember seeing in the Radio Times for the new year, 98, new series, Vicar of Dibley, and thinking, oh, that's interesting, they have actually made a new series of the Vicar of Dibley, that'll be good to watch, catch up with Alice and Hugo, who have just got together at last, but that was only enough another three episodes in the new year, so that's kind of a four episode series really, the Christmas special 97 and those three episodes at the beginning of 98, and the DVD box set treats them as four episodes of series two. And even though they're worth doing particularly for the sake of Hugo and Alice, it is the beginning of a downward slope. Then there were four more episodes, seasonal specials titled Autumn, Winter, Spring and Summer. Those aired over the Christmas and New Year period of 1999 and 2000. I guess they're set in late 99 and Spring and Summer 2000. And watching that, I think, oh, I wish it was the Hugo and Alice getting married stuff. But when I'm watching the Hugo and Alice getting married stuff, I'm thinking, oh, I wish it was the first series or those two specials. And then after that, it really gets into a trough with a pair of specials, a very, very long special, 50-something minutes, which is all about Geraldine's 10th anniversary as vicar. And they do mention it is 2004, which fits in with the series stuff 
starting in 1994. Not that the continuity is very good on this show. They forget what they've written, the two writers, Richard Curtis and Paul Mayhew Archer. They recycle jokes, they establish facts and then contradict them, such as Geraldine's actual first name being Bodicea, and which of the Spice Girls Hugo fancies. And how many reverends have preceded Geraldine as the vicar of Dibley since 1917? The real, true answer they should have stuck with is one. Reverend Pottle. And the second one of those is more like half an hour or just over, and it did rather upset a lot of people. It was raising awareness of and making statements and suggesting solutions to extreme world poverty, which is fine, which is a very good thing to do, including in the sitcom. And there is a version of that that sometimes gets shown where they cut the really distressing bits, and still it's making that statement and giving out that message, which I think worked very well. And people were upset. They thought it was inappropriate to show the really sad, really, really tragic side of it in a sitcom. And I think it suggests an assumption that we don't know and we don't care, and they're sort of forcing you into it. I think a lot of people did feel ambushed, because the sitcom hadn't been on for coming up to five years. The BBC is saying, oh look, new Vicar of Dibley, I'd like to see that again after all this time. And the second episode is all about trying to shock you into engaging with their own agenda about this very important subject. I don't think it's very well integrated into the episode, characters all sitting there watching the distressing video. It made me think when we were watching it through this time of the episode in series one, with the broken church window and the earthquake appeal. And okay, that's a fictional earthquake, but it's still integrating a more serious message about charity and aid into the sitcom, and sits much better in the sequence of events and the feel of the episode. I think. But I didn't mean to imply that that was the reason it was a trough, though I suppose it's part of it, but the thing is that the jokes have become very forced, as can happen when you've got a sitcom that's really used up all its ideas, you've got these characters, oh what would this character say, what would that character say, and you can tell it hasn't come naturally, they've had to kind of drag out some new jokes. I think the first one, the Christmas anniversary, has its moment. Geraldine doing the service drunk is somewhat amusing, which is as a result of the Archbishop of Canterbury finding her all covered with chocolate from her chocolate fountain that the villagers have given her for her anniversary surprise. And that's quite amusing. Dawn French sticking her head in the chocolate fountain. But it's none of it up to what it was. I remember finding in late 2004 a kind of Vicar of Dibley celebration evening on a cable channel, and it was going on about, ooh, ten years of the Vicar of Dibley. I thought, what do you mean ten years of the Vicar of Dibley? We haven't seen it for almost five years. But then it was saying, new episodes for Christmas and New Year, and I thought, oh, goodness me, they dragged that up again, haven't they? And as it turned out, yes, dragged up was quite an accurate description. So when it came to 06, 07, Christmas, New Year, and there was going to be another pair of specials, we didn't have very high hopes. But then actually the first one did make us laugh quite a lot, not as much as it used to, but it was comical. Actually re-watching it recently and thinking, well, maybe it's lost a bit of something after a few watches. We did still laugh at that first one. The annoying thing is that it is all about Geraldine suddenly falling instantly in mutual love with Richard Armitage, having decided in those specials that are in the trough that she's terribly lonely and wants to be married and is only half as good without a man, which I do think is a shame. So this pair of specials is her happy ending. And of course, what's a happy ending for a woman? Give her a man. That's what male writers seem to think, or certainly do. 10 plus years ago and then the second half of that I mean it's not bad but it's not as good as the first half but it certainly comes up from its downward slope that it was on for a very very long time 
Geraldine's search for or hope for a nice man is something that does pop up at various points in the show. The big one being when she has her relationship, which turns out to be all too brief, with Clive Mantle as Simon Horton, brother of one of the main characters who we'll talk about soon. And then, of course, there's a bit in the Christmas lunch Christmas special with Peter Capaldi turning up and the quite famous now, I think, misunderstanding about him asking her to marry him. So in a way you could say that Geraldine settling down happily with a nice younger man. Whose character's name I didn't mention, it's Harry Jasper Kennedy. Oh, let's hope that doesn't get a giggle at the service. Is the correct kind of culmination of her journey through the series. But really it's only one aspect of her character. And she doesn't seem to have been so desperate and lonely before. So perhaps, yes, in the end it is a bit of a shame and does define her a bit too much as a woman being written by men. Talking of which, you were reading the other day, weren't you, that Richard Curtis and Paul Mayhew Archer hadn't really got a lot of full or very funny ideas for the character of Geraldine Granger. And we were both saying that we kind of thought, because Dawn French was so very famous, and because she seemed very suited to the lines that she'd been given, like they'd been written for her, that the part had been created for her. Of course, by that stage, the lines had been written for her specifically, but when the guys first had the idea and Dawn French was approached, it wasn't definite that she was going to play the part, and she actually wasn't sure that she wanted to for this reason, that the character didn't seem particularly well-developed or anything like as funny as the rest of the cast. And so she floated some ideas of her own, things that she could make funny, this thing about wanting the men, it was a sort of comedic animal sexual thing a lot of the time that I think was one of her suggestions. And also going after chocolate the whole time and comfort eating when she's been ditched by Simon and all that kind of thing. And giving it up for Lent was one of the very first things we saw her do in that Easter special. Another piece of Dawn French input I read was that she wanted Geraldine to be a bit vain, as the report I was reading put it. I guess I can see what it means by that. And these are all things that Dawn French thought she could perform in a funny way and make the character of the vicar funny. And indeed, I think she was right. It's rather like we were saying on our Blackadder podcast about Queen Elizabeth I in Blackadder 2. The male writers, again, Richard Curtis being one of them, don't really know what the woman character is going to be like. And then the actress, Miranda Richardson in that case, comes in and makes the character, develops the character, fleshes out the character, and turns her into a successful comedy character. Andy Hamilton said the same thing about Sue Brockman, the mum character in Outnumbered. Oh, she started out as just a sort of every mum character. I mean, how lazy is that? And then Claire Skinner came and helped to flesh her out a bit. It's a fairly unique phenomenon for a BBC sitcom, this sporadic coming back, and as you said, only ever having one six-episode series, which most BBC sitcoms have stuck to pretty stringently, although sometimes you'll get seven episodes chucked in for good measure. And we were discussing how there are two equally telling reasons for that. One being, as you were saying, that the sit of the sitcom, you can't get a lot out of it. And a lot of the time, the funny stuff does end up being something that could just as well have been a sketch in French and Saunders. So it's not a very sustainable series by series show premise, I think. And the other reason is that apparently the actors had quite a lot of other things to do and used to find it quite tricky to find the time to all get back together and make the big of Ghibli. And what makes me say this in particular is a piece of daytime television I once found on at lunchtime while I was off school ill, probably. And it was something like Loose Women, but probably not actually Loose Women, but a woman talking to guests in the middle of the day. And sitting there being interviewed were Gary Waldhorn, James Fleet and Roger Lloyd. Pack three of the staple actors.
extras from the Vicar of Dibley, whose characters were mentioned very soon, and they were being asked, oh, is there going to be more Vicar of Dibley? Are you going to get back together for the Vicar of Dibley? And they all said, oh, we love getting together for the Vicar of Dibley, but we're all so busy and find it so hard to schedule it, we don't know when or if it might be back. And I think that was probably always the case. So they all came back to it when they could, and that made the show sustainable with a runtime of 13 years, really, but with 20 episodes produced during that time. And some comic relief slash children in need specials, which are variously bizarre. And of course, you mentioned the Vicar of Dibley in lockdown. And even before that, since 2007, they have done three, I think, charity specials. So New Year's Day 2007 is a definite end, happy end to the series, but they've never been afraid to dip back in as they can. I remember that at least two of those charity specials of the three you just mentioned were centred around the theme of women bishops, which was quite interesting, actually, that they'd come back to that original idea of female church leaders. I expect even before Dawn French got hold of her, Geraldine was supposed to be a very kind, selfless, modern-thinking, lively, village-enriching character. She certainly still is with Dawn French's additions. She's kind of a breath of fresh air in a very musty old place that most or all of the characters at first find something of a shock and then embrace and appreciate having the cobweb blown off them as it were. I think we might talk some more about Geraldine in relation to the other characters and how they are influenced by her presence. Starting most particularly with David Horton, played by Gary Waldhorn, and he's the one who, from the start, gets to be also credited in the opening sequence, which, as everyone knows, is panning over countryside to the song, the hymn, The Lord is My Shepherd. It starts with panning over the M40 and then out into the lovely countryside to mirror the kind of journey that I think Geraldine is coming on into this lovely country village out somewhere more urban for the first time. David is the one who is opposed to Geraldine in particular and woman vicars in general and he comes around to her by the end of that first series and by the end, the Richard Armitage specials particularly, he's fonder of her than anyone and it's actually one of the quite amusing bits and one of the nods back to the original premise and ideas when they're looking at old pictures of the village when Geraldine was new and David standing there with a sign saying saying nothing is sicker than a woman vicar and things like that, which we don't actually see him do on screen, but we do go, oh yes, that did used to be David's attitude, how far he has come, and we can quite believe that he was doing that off screen when we weren't looking. And David is a character who represents those kinds of views against women vicars and against any kind of change, particularly the kind of change that takes away from the very comfortable, wealthy, white, middle-class man that he is. And we're introduced to him really getting his way at the parish council meeting, refusing to allow people to pursue applications for extensions and things to improve their homes and then saying and my son Hugo wants a conservatory for his hothouse plant which I think should be fine and then Hugo who we'll come back to later adds somewhere to keep the pool table at last eh and no one else on the parish council has anything to say about that and then the next thing is that he's talking to Hugo about some expensive whiskey that he keeps hidden from the villagers and gives them cheap nasty sherry because they can't tell the difference and when Geraldine turns up coming to Dibley Manor to meet the villagers she calls him out on his cheap sherry and says oh haven't you got anything nicer I think I saw some really good whiskey in your cupboard so straight away after revealing that she is in fact a woman vicar which David seems to think is some sort of sick joke immediately she's challenging his elitist and selfish ideas it's quite striking if, like us, you started after the first series with the Easter special, how much of an antagonist David is in the first 
series, Geraldine and the others joining in with her. She spurs them on to do so, trying to get the better of David, stop him having his own way the whole time. And it's always nice to see a character going on a journey. And David certainly does go on a journey, so he can become a sustainable part of the show. But they have an eye on his less redeeming qualities at times when they need to. When Hugo and Alice are getting together and getting engaged and getting married and things, David is very resistant to the whole thing and needs thwarting again and needs bringing round to it. Geraldine is very much on hand to do that. And even when David is at peace with the idea and has accepted it, and perhaps even started to embrace it, it's funny his reaction to Alice's stupid wedding costumes and things. And he's obviously absolutely hating it, really embarrassed and just putting up with it. And he sees the flower girls in the Teletubbies costumes and things and has to go, oh my god, and turn away. So you can see his original character still there, but it's used effectively to create some comedy there. And we see how he has become better, more tolerant, and deserves his position as really a protagonist after the first series. I think those sorts of things you were talking about, his reaction to the bizarre stuff at Alice's wedding and his being rather irritated by the more eccentric characters in a way, creates a sort of connection with Geraldine because they are the two normal ones in the village. So actually, once he's accepted her as a vicar and as the way forward, they become really quite good friends. When she's tactfully turning down his marriage proposal, she says something along those lines, just because we're the only two really sane people in the village. If you combine that with a dollop of loneliness, it's not a good reason to get married. I always thought it was a bit of a sort of desperate story. I and David asking Geraldine to marry him. It's in the third of those four seasonal specials. It's kind of midlife crisis is quite funny. He wears the silly bright coloured shirts and jeans and the reflection of the change in their relationship and some of their interactions there and their fondness for each other. But yes, it's not really the right thing to get married. That works quite well. I think Gary Waldhorn does particularly well to make that character funny as well as an antagonist and as well as the sort of straight man of the village. You were reminding me when we were going to watch the Easter special of how funny it is. When at the parish council meeting, it turns out everyone believes in the Dibley Easter Bunny and Geraldine's like, you don't really all believe in the Easter Bunny. And they're like, we have our own Easter Bunny in Dibley. And at the end of everyone saying they believe in it, David goes, yes, that's right. And that has more impact once you have seen the first series and got the hang of how weird all the characters are except David, who talks really the most sense, although he doesn't always have the best ideas. And of course David is the one who then says to Geraldine, yes of course we all know it's one of us in a costume but it's a nice village tradition. And we're like, oh yes, okay. And now I think the next character we'd better talk about is Hugo Horton. And on this latest watcher in particular, I noticed he was being used as someone for David to talk to, to air his ideas about woman vicars, whiskey, the local elections, whatever is going on. The character is played by James Fleet, and as you can grasp from the bit I mentioned with the conservatory for his hot house plants, which is actually a cover-up for a pool table, he will just kind of affably go along with what David wants up until the last episode of the first series, which is when Geraldine is having her service for animals, and goats and dogs and hamsters and things are coming into the church, and David's hoping it'll be a disaster and the key to getting Geraldine sacked from Dibley and Hugo stands up to him and refuses to sit with him pointedly not going to the animal service and takes their lovely retriever Bruno along. And you were saying how when David says there to Hugo, well you do what you think is right, when he said this to Hugo in the past throughout Hugo's life, which is supposed to be about 30 years at that point, Hugo has then thought, oh well I'd better do what Dad wants then. But this time he doesn't. He goes to the animal service with Bruno, and we can see how Geraldine is having such a positive impact on the village and the people who live there. Hugo is one of the eccentric, very comedic characters. I don't know about you, but I find it difficult to put my finger on why he's funny. Yes, it's a tough one, that. 
we were talking about how he's kind of a character like Alice, where they go, oh, he's stupid, he's saying something stupid, isn't he stupid, isn't he funny? But actually, he's more sort of vague and eccentric than stupid. I like the bit where Geraldine is not quite sure if Hugo and Alice are going to have a successful wedding night. She's saying to him, now you know what to do on the wedding night, Hugo. And he tells us they're going to have hot water bottles and warm pyjamas or whatever it is for a kind of joke. Laugh at Hugo, oh dear, he doesn't get what Geraldine's talking about. But then he very knowingly tells her that he's also bringing along a video of basic instinct. So we realise, ah yes, Hugo does have more idea than we might suppose and a lot of the jokes perhaps sometimes imply. One of my favourite bits in the Christmas lunch incident derives from the David Hugo old dynamic sort of rearing its head a bit. Now in case you weren't aware, Geraldine has agreed because she's too nice to say no to have three different sets of Christmas lunch, the second of which is with David and Hugo. They have this bet on every year that David can or cannot eat more sprouts than the guests. And so Geraldine has the opportunity to say thank you very much, that was a lovely lunch, I don't want any more sprouts, thank you, and leave. But then because Hugo says, when it seems David has won the bet, oh yes, you're right as usual, father, you win again, just like every game we've ever played since I was born, Geraldine leaps in with, hang on, I think maybe I can manage a couple more after all. And she's forcing down all these sprouts that she really doesn't have to eat, just to to try and stick up for Hugo a bit. And then because she wins, they make her eat an entire Christmas pudding, which is also very funny. And then as you were touching on earlier, Hugo has to stand up to David again when there is opposition to the marriage to Alice. And there's a very significant scene where David is telling Hugo that he's going to cut him out of his will. You will have nothing. And of course, Hugo says, on the contrary, sir, I shall have everything in the world that I desire. And Geraldine is there and Dawn French does a amusing sort of fist pump, which again shows how she is in Hugo's corner, always sticking up for the underdog. I think it's particularly impactful when you remember the bits where Hugo is not assertive, like the local elections, which I mentioned briefly. He's going around trying to canvas votes for David, and his argument is, he's jolly nice. And then this character who appears a couple of times that Hugo's talking to at this moment says, I vote him for the vicar. Hugo's response is, uh, well, she's jolly nice too, which is one of the sort of amusing things he says. Another one is when he's going to make a speech, and he says he's not very good at speeches, normally start gibbering absolute talkish. That kind of line James Fleet can deliver very well. From there, I think we'd better move on to Alice. Now, Emma Chambers did a very, very good job playing Alice. Unfortunately, she died in 2018. She did such a good job as Alice and made everybody laugh so much. She quite rightly gained recognition and got to be and Emma Chambers in the opening credits. But the trouble with that is the writers think, oh no, we have to keep Alice funny after all this. And I think the humour with her becomes real really very forced, which is a shame. You could say she's a breakout character, as she did experience unexpected popularity, and as is sometimes the case with breakout characters, they do get overdone, and by the end you're sick at the side of them. This is all reminding me of Cartman, South Park Derek Cartman, who's that kind of a breakout character, really, and you get a bit sick of him, and he has sort of two sides to him, a protagonist and an antagonist, and so does Alice. She has the complete duffer who says stupid things and doesn't really know what's going on, but also she can really step up to the plate at times of crisis as the verger. For example, when Geraldine is drunk, which I mentioned, she comes and addresses the congregation. Our vicar is making a comment on the problem of binge drinking. She thinks of that all by herself. She prompts Geraldine when Geraldine has forgotten the name Jesus. Geraldine said, Jeremy, no, no, that's not right, and Alice is going, Jesus, and he's on French, Geraldine goes, Jesus, and you think, yeah, she's going to accept that, and then she turns around and says, no, that's not right either. I wasn't expecting that, that got a laugh. 
And in fact, the other time I'm thinking of is our first introduction to Alice in the very first scene where she corrects Reverend Pottle, who said that the Queen is having trouble with her piles again, but actually that bit was supposed to be one of the local villagers. And then after he's finished, he just dies. And Alice notices and stands up and carries on the service, telling everybody what hymn to sing. And she's the only person in the whole church who realises that he's dead. So when David is saying, this is another example of David no longer getting his way, we can give that awful verger Alice the heave-ho, we might be thinking, she's a very good verger, why would you want to get rid of her? And it's not until later when she starts speaking and acting in other contexts that we see why David doesn't think she is quite the ticket. It's revealed later in that first episode that Alice has replaced all the communion wine with Ribena because the Reverend Pottle used to get drunk on the communion wine. We see how Alice takes her position of backing up the vicar and making things run very smoothly in the church very seriously and does it very well. There's the bit where Geraldine is all depressed about Simon Horton, David's brother, having dumped her. And Alice is coming over in her verger costume and very tactfully saying it's Sunday and there are services at the church supposed to be happening. Are you going to come and do them? Alice and her mum and sister are the hosts of Geraldine's third Christmas lunch. We've already been prepared to meet this sister who Alice says is not as well, you know, on the ball as I am. So the audience might be thinking as Geraldine is, good heavens, she must be quite something if she's less on the ball than Alice. And then actually her sister Mary, played by Mel Edroik, is less on the ball than Alice and makes Alice seem really rather intelligent because Alice knows it's Christmas, whereas Mary thinks it's Easter. And Alice, of course, knows Geraldine is the vicar, and Mary reckons he told me she was a mare. Mary, you can't believe it's Christmas, so why am I wearing this jumper with a big Easter bunny on it? And Alice says, well, I've been meaning to ask you that all morning. And then their mum is funny too, with her, not exactly catchphrase, because it's a little different each time, but basically it's, was she? Yeah, she was. Was she? Yeah, she was. Oh, she was, was she? That makes us laugh. It's one of those things that's just rather random and silly and amusing. And then, of course, they've had this whole lunch together, and Geraldine leaves and says goodbye, Mr Tinker, thank you so very much. And after she's gone, mum turns to Alice and says, who was that then? Alice will relate at times to Geraldine conversations she's had with her mother that are perfectly normal conversations. But then after we've actually had the mum on the screen doing her have you, well, you have, have you, Alice comes and tells Geraldine about a conversation that has gone like that. So we'll remember the scene from earlier and laugh. It's a shame that Alice's mum and sister don't appear on screen except in that Christmas lunch Christmas special. It would be good to see them in the church while Alice is getting married, for example. And that just would have fleshed out the universe that little bit more, but they certainly do make a very welcome addition to the show for that scene they're in. One of the major events in the seasonal specials is, of course, the birth of Alice and Hugo's first child, Geraldine. Not, as Alice is planning to call her at first, Vicar. And then when we do come back almost five years later, what has happened? Alice and Hugo have had nine more children, and they will make an on-screen appearance, and we work out which one is Geraldine, the oldest one, who looks very much like a kind of Alice clone now. And it's obviously supposed to be funny that Alice and Hugo have had ten children, but we find that a bit disappointing as a development, don't we? It's not really funny. It kind of devalues Geraldine as a character after the previous series was such a journey to getting her born and commemorated in a statue that shows the village looking forward to the future. Yes, that was disappointing. We did have a bit of a pause on the ten children and work out how many we thought were triplets and twins and we thought that Alice had had five more pregnancies, six altogether, so I suppose if she had one a year, there was time, but it's just a bit silly and not worth it because we didn't laugh and were even disappointed. 
And then that leaves the rest of the parish council. Actually, all the characters we've mentioned are on the parish council, except for Alice. It's a very important set piece and kind of base for the characters and the comedy, those parish council meetings. And there was always something very familiar and comforting about seeing them all sitting around whatever tables they're using in their places to kick off the episode. Of course, one of them is ousted from the show, Liz Smith as Letitia Cropley. In fact, her character died shortly after we were introduced to her in that Easter special. I remember thinking that most probably Liz Smith had decided she didn't want to do it anymore because she was so busy. Even though the other actors are in things, Liz Smith was the one that I had seen doing a lot of other work and I had got the idea from neighbours and things like that that sometimes actors, particularly prolific actors, could be difficult to pin down and might want to leave. I didn't suppose that Richard Curtis had decided to get rid of her, but actually he had, which I think is a shame. She's one of four, and we'll talk about the other three, who come to the parish council meetings and have their foible, their comedic running joke, and hers was that she cooked as one of the characters, Owen puts it, garbage, such as she put liver in pancakes or something. It's difficult to remember specifically what they are. A marmite cake was one of her early ones. But after this is established, one thing that did get a laugh out of us was that we saw her making a cake and she just quite casually naturally picks up the ketchup and squirts it all over this rather up to then traditional looking cake that she was making it was also good a kind of spoken version of that when she was saying she wanted to get a hold of some snails to put in her bread and butter pudding surprise that isn't all the comedy they would get out of her. For instance, when there is talk of trying to get a celebrity to open the Dibley Fair, perhaps somebody off the television. It's a funny thing to say, isn't it? You mean Michael Fish, like he's the only person on television. I like the part where she's talking about how she's enjoyed Lady Chatterley's lover which at the time was very notorious for having had Sean Bean's bottom all over it and being on rather sexual television content. And Letitia has enjoyed the gardening tip she got from it. We were all like, oh yeah, I see. And then she adds, I thought the sex was jolly good fun too, which certainly got a laugh. She's always sitting doing her crochet in the meeting. She's always wearing a crocheted hat and crocheting another hat. In the one with the local election, she wants a bus for the WI, that's good use of her. And, quite honestly, is all of this any less sustainable than the three guys we're about to go on and talk about? I don't think so, especially as, after they got rid of her, straight away from the Christmas special and then into the Hugo and Alice marriage stuff, and possibly even after that, they kept coming out with gross food combination jokes. Alice submitted a recipe to the parish newsletter that had some weird combination. It was chocolate cake and one of the ingredients was haddock. That's right. And we were saying, oh, that's Mrs. Cropley's chocolate cake. Alice should say, I got the recipe from Mrs. Cropley years ago, at least. And then there's the odd bit that's not quite so stark, but Owen, who perhaps we'll get to next, his traditional Christmas fare is tripe, which is gross. Alice's mum gives Geraldine stuffing, which is balls of stuffing. And then there's Alice's suggestion for a not-so-predictable I love curly whirlies because they're very, very nice with sausages. And it's something that obviously the writers like and keep coming back to, and really it was silly of them to kill the character whose thing that is. I remember being very surprised watching the Easter special. I thought, oh, goodness me, the old lady character is dying. Like you, I thought Liz Smith must have other things she wants to do. And to find out that she was actually axed from the show, to read how Liz Smith had later said she was disappointed and the junior production assistant had rung her up and told her about it, and she thought Richard Curtis should have told her about it. 
We'll move on to Roger Lloyd Pack now as Owen. He actually gives Geraldine her fourth Christmas lunch, coming over and inviting her after she thinks it's finally over. And it's not just swearing, is it? It's what he swears about a lot of the time. It's his disgusting farming problems like cows with diarrhoea and animals getting caught in the shredder and that sort of thing. He's unashamedly crap. He's also very forthcoming, and I suppose that fits in with his crassness. He says what he thinks, for instance, when Frank, who will also come to, reads out from the minutes, the parish council has decided to give a few hundred pounds to the Scots. Owen's reaction is very comical, and he says, what the hell for? Which gets a laugh. So you can use him for funny, comedic things like that, but also, as you were pointing out to me the other day, he's the first one to speak up Geraldine when the council all goes against David and votes not to send a letter to the bishop but to give Geraldine a chance. A very significant moment there. Geraldine's presence for the first time has caused the council to argue with David and gainsay David. And Owen is the first one who speaks up and says, well, I didn't vote on it. I think we should give her a chance. Quite surprising, really, following what he's been saying earlier in the episode. He's been the most vociferous publicly. He was actually the only one to say to Geraldine's face in response to, she's our new vicar. No, she's not. She's a woman. And then there's this discussion between him and Mrs. Crockley and Jim, who we'll also get to, about how things have to change, as Mrs. Crockley says. And Owen is the one who said it can't be right, a woman vicar. And he, in response to look at traffic lights, says, oh, the gravity of that change will go floating up into space. And he seems to be very against having a woman vicar. And he is vociferous about that, but then he changes his mind and he's vociferous about that too. And there's a lot to be said for that, really, coming out and saying what you think. And the other bit that reminded me of Owen's contribution there to the first episode was where Geraldine and Simon were having their relationship and David was saying, oh, I don't think it's quite right. Jesus doesn't approve of sex before marriage and things. And Owen sums up very nicely why it's rather stupid and narrow-minded to churn out bits of the Bible as justification for your modern bigotry, which David is not at all averse to doing at times. Owen very correctly points out, well, things were different back then, weren't they? Women weren't emancipated. It's a way of saying traditions change as we grow more enlightened. Now, we have been talking about sustainability and the possible lack thereof in this show, and there becomes a running gag with Owen that I find awfully boring after a while, which is that he wants to sleep with Geraldine. Now, it is quite amusing when he's telling her that he's never been kissed and Geraldine allows him to kiss her. It's visually very comical. He's coming at her with wide open mouth and they fall over onto the sofa and all that kind of thing. And from there he gets it into his head to ask her to marry him, which of course she refuses. And you know, it's okay. It's in that group of four episodes which are basically about Alice and Hugo and what's going on during their wedding preparations. But then after that he will keep making crass comments about wanting to go to bed with Geraldine and it does get very samey and very boring and I think much less funny than gross cakes of Mrs. Cropley had still been there. It's one of the main examples of how the show does deteriorate into crass sexual humour and it does start to rely on that rather too much. I've always felt, certainly when we get to the final four specials. When I bought the DVD box set for Rosie's birthday, our uncle told us that The Vicar of Dibley was a show that had been enjoyed by a rather pious, clueless great aunt of ours in the past, and we were like, really? And we found that a very hard concept to come to terms with, what with the show having become so rude and crass in its latter years. But then we thought about the early episodes, the first series, the first couple of specials, and realised, oh yes, I suppose our pious, clueless great aunt, who was very keen on the church, would have enjoyed those, and any of the rude stuff, which is much less evident in those early ones, would have gone over her head. 
And I think the other character that suffers from that is Jim, who is played by an actor called Trevor Peacock. And he ends up, just skipping ahead to how he ends up here, as little more than a kind of disgusting sexual deviant. And all the humour that comes out of him is perverted sexual humour that he talks about and claims to have taken part in in the past. And I think that does smack of rather desperation for jokes and isn't funny at all. Yes, I do agree with that, especially since in the first series he has a wife and I don't think anyone would have thought that he'd been doing much sexually with anyone other than her for most of his life. Of course, they clear the way for Jim's new pool of humour by saying that his wife is actually a lesbian and they've split up. Which also isn't funny. But Jim's original running gag is surprisingly sustainable and never stops being funny. For Lent, what he gives up is, as Geraldine terms it, dithering, which is her way of referring to his habit of starting most sentences, particularly those which are giving a yes or no answer, with no, 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 no in some form, some number of no's, some inflection or other, which is usually quite different and always very funny. I think the best example is when he's doing the loud hailer announcements at the Dibley Fair. First of all, he says no, 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 no parking is allowed in the other field, so then people don't know if there's parking allowed there or not, and then even funnier than that is no, 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 no refreshments will be served in the refreshment tent. It's a bit clearer what that one means, but it's also very comical to listen to. Another part I always liked in the first series was when it turns out that Jim's wife, Doris, kind of does the opposite of him, and she starts sentences with, yes, 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 and then, no. And in the election one, when Geraldine and David have come round to talk to Jim and Doris, the conversation they have on the doorstep is funny, it's got all the no, 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 going, and yes, 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 and you wonder how they really manage to communicate. Yes, 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 do they want to come in? No, 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 I haven't asked them yet. You were talking about how in the 2004-05 special sort of time, it was getting kind of desperate for jokes and making the characters funny. And that 2004 Christmas 10-year anniversary one opens with Owen just randomly asking Jim, who do you think's the best musical act ever? No, 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 no. Nolan sisters. Which is rather a forced way to get in the joke and kick off the specials, make us go, oh yeah, that's funny, isn't it? But then they do the same sort of thing much more successfully a few years later in those Richard Armitage specials, kicking the first one off with a much more organic, natural version of the joke which is a sign of things to come for the rest of the episode, really. It's going to be an improvement on the last lot, because, of course, very much in the soup at that time was Deal or No Deal. And wouldn't you know it, that was presented by Noel Edmonds. And I do just wonder if there was any, oh, shall we make a bit more bigger of Dibley, shall we not? That would have to be the clincher, wouldn't it? Jim with a story of when he appeared on Deal or No Deal. £250,000 in one box, 10p in the other, and the banker offered £100,000, and he wanted a deal, so when no, 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 Noel Edmonds asked the question, of course he replied, no, 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 deal, and for some reason that he cannot fathom, they thought he meant no, 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 deal, and if you know Jim, of course you can hear the difference. And that leaves Frank, who we've also briefly mentioned. And if I had to pick one of those characters to say, well, I think this one is only as sustainable as or even less than Mrs. Cropley, it's Frank, played by John Bluthal. And his thing that he gives up for Lent is being a pedantic old fart about the minutes, as David puts it. 
He wants to very accurately minute everything that's said, including when Mrs. Crockley said nothing. And then that kind of gets exaggerated as he goes along. He will want to refer back to minutes from 50 years ago and that kind of thing. And then from there they take it into, he's not just pedantic about the minutes, but he's boring generally and he will bore people with his speeches at parties and things like that. It's an extension of the original minutes joke where he's trying out his shorthand to do the minutes, but he can't actually read back and work out what his shorthand means, which is why he's read out that they're going to give money to the Scots when Owen says what for, but it was actually meant to be the Scouts. A bit of humour out of that, but there's not a huge amount more humour to get out of Frank taking the minutes. And being generally boring, I guess, is a reasonable extension of that. But then we're both disappointed by the humour they end up doing with him. After he has come out on the radio, nobody's bothered listening to it, but he's been struggling, wanting to tell them for years that he's gay. Quite a sweet scene, really. Quite a touching revelation. And he refers to the people who he thinks are listening as his dear friends. And Geraldine is in the background reacting. And at first, she is rather shocked, a bit more shocked, I think, than her other experiences of gay characters like Bertie the Bishop and her telling David it wouldn't matter a bit if Hugo was gay. I don't know why she's quite so amazed to hear that Frankie's gay. But, of course, it's a sort of comedy oh my goodness what's he saying but then as Frank continues and speaks from the heart to his friends Geraldine's reaction is more sort of oh isn't that sweet and of course it makes sense for Frank to not have been comfortable talking about it as we find out he was born in 1929 which is actually a continuity error about when he previously had his 60th birthday which should have been his 65th but it's something he hasn't been free to talk about and demonstrate at a lot of times during his life and that is handled quite sensitively in that scene but then of course it's kind of easy and lazy to then make all jokes about oh Frank gay. Let's have him say things about wanting to be the toothbrush that gets stuck up somebody's bottom things. Yes, they're discussing possible play ideas when that comes up. And it's rather a shame to handle a character that has come out in that way, just get cheap, crass humour out of it. But I suppose exactly like Owen and Jim, they have to think of crude, crass humour to keep him sustainable. I think his vision of his ideal life partner in the final episode is quite amusing. Someone who's 25 years old with an interest in Oxfordshire Village Parish Council procedure who is also South American. Probably not going to come across that person and perhaps that's why he's single still after all this time. So a little bit of gentle humour incorporating his sexuality. There's nothing wrong with that. Just like any sort of gentle sexual humour. But it is another thing, yeah, that's rather mindlessly taken too far. Frank and Jim team up for the day at Christmas. Jim's wife hasn't left him yet, but she's away on a competent grandparenting course, which I don't think is very likely to be going on on Christmas Day, really, but they just want her out of the way. They do say that they used to have lunch with Mrs. Cropley, but now that she is not there, they would like Geraldine to come to lunch, and of course it had to be them doing the first Christmas lunch because they were the only characters who I hadn't mentioned having Geraldine round. She has Christmas lunch with all of them. And it's very, very funny, and it's my favourite episode, I think, even though it is post-Mrs. Cropley. And I do remember Richard Curtis on a documentary or something talking about that one. What he liked about the idea was it was unusual in a sitcom to base the comedy around somebody being kind. If you think about Blackadder, who of course he was very much involved with, and Basil Fawlty, which he wasn't. He's right, there isn't really much of a precedent for humour derived from kindness, and it works very well. Unlike her other three lunches that day, her later three lunches, Geraldine very much enjoys her Christmas lunch. Frank and Jim, and they all have a very good laugh about the cracker jokes and so on. Do you get it, Vicar? Not as often as I'd like, Frank. That would have gone over our great aunt's head.
head, of course. And I like some of the build up to that with Frank and Jim quite shyly trying to ask her. Jim and I are getting together. Not that we're an item, do I? Stand, just getting together, combining forces for the day. And Jim adds, just the day, not the night. And sometimes I find myself laughing about Frank and Jim's Christmas dinner. Geraldine's discovered she's already bitten off far more than she can chew. She's had to eat meat and 16 veg with Frank and Jim. And then the Christmas pudding's coming out and she's saying, oh, well, maybe I'll just have a little bit. And of course, Frank and Jim each have a huge Christmas pudding as well. And Geraldine's like, one eat. Right, and it very much goes downhill from there. Yes, I like David's dinner after that. He produces, she says, a family-sized portion of pasta. But before she says that, she says, Oh, that's original. I'm not going with the traditional turkey then. Well, not for the starter, no. And we're like, oh my goodness, it's going to be three courses. But then, of course, she says, after that, she only wants a little bit of turkey. And David says, he won't be having any turkey. Not until after the fish course. And then she has to eat a whole fish. And then I told you earlier about the bit with the sprouts, which I think is very funny, and then another whole Christmas pudding as the winner's reward. And then the jokes of plying her with various specific food that rather run dry. So we don't get that at Alice's dinner. What we get instead is Geraldine trying to get out of it by making it into a story about the vicar who agreed to have three different sets of Christmas lunch, and the third one was with her best friend, and the best friend said, hey, that's okay, you don't have to eat all this food. So then Alice responds with, oh, well, that's where it's not like me at all, because I would just cry and cry if we made all this food for you, and it turned out you'd eaten already. See, my sister is crying just hearing the story. So, of course, she has to have the third lunch. And then Roger Lloyd Pack does the good bit where he's trying to persuade Geraldine to come to his lunch and it's talking about how he hasn't had any company on Christmas Day since the year they introduced decibel currency. And it ends up with, will you come to lunch? Give me company on Christmas Day for the first time since 1971 or reject me just like I've been rejected by everyone every day since the day I was born. What do you say? And of course Geraldine does not have the heart to reject him. And then it's Owen's traditional Christmas fair. And then it's Peter Capaldi coming around with his... I was just wondering if you'd marry me. Peter Capaldi is a character who was called Tristan when we first met him coming to be the producer of Songs of Praise in the first series. And then he's written in the cast for that one as Tristram. And then when we see him the second time, he is called Tristram. And we did actually blacklist Peter Capaldi on our Musketeers podcast. Now, this role of Tristan or Tristram is not very challenging. So unlike bits of the Musketeers that Peter Capaldi is in, he doesn't ruin it. But he doesn't make it pop either. And I did just want to mention that again, because one of the things I enjoy in the first Harry episode is Richard Armitage coming round to ask, will you marry me? And of course, Geraldine thinks he means, will you marry me to Keeley Hawes, who she believes has come and taken her man. So she's saying, oh, yes, of course, I'd be delighted to. Let's get some of the admin out of the way. And Richard Armitage is doing some quite good reactions in the the background clearly thinking this wasn't what I was expecting she would say so it's some version of that really probably quite famous scene with Peter Capaldi given that they show it pretty much every Christmas day the other bit of famous scene referencing they do in that one is Geraldine in the puddle when she was frolicking with Clive Mantle comedy sequence where they're jumping in puddles and Geraldine jumps at a puddle that actually she sinks all the way up to her head in Quite a famous bit as well, but obviously they didn't think it was as famous as I was wondering if you'd marry me, because Alice has to remind us in the dialogue of when you were jumping in puddles with Uncle Simon, and you went in one right up to your neck, and then we see Geraldine voluntarily jumping into a puddle that far to hide from Richard Armitage and Keeley Hawes. And then, of course, we all know what's coming, because earlier in the episode she has talked about Emma Thompson's performance in Sense and Sensibility, 
possibility, which I think is my favourite bit. She's describing how Hugh Grant has come round to tell the character, Eleanor Dashwood, that he's in love with her. And as Harry says, oh yes, and she makes that extraordinary noise. <laughs> That's right, she sort of goes... Bleh! She talks about how if someone's coming round to tell you that they're available after all and they love you and want to marry you, you probably wouldn't go... Bleh! And then, of course, we all know that that's what's going to happen to her later. Harry will come round and say that he loves her, and she will make a similar noise, if not exactly the same one. And that's really the sort of thing I meant when I said that that episode is comical. It's perhaps not as sort of clever and poignant as some of the earlier stuff, but we did enjoy it. And it's always nice to end a podcast on a note of enjoyment. Hopefully there'll be plenty of notes of enjoyment when you join us for our next podcast on the final Sunday in April, which will be principally about art attack and how to, but will stray into the territory of other similar shows from the 90s, from children's ITV and beyond as we do something we haven't done for a while and look back once again at some of our after school viewing experiences. Until then, Good night out there. Whatever you are.